Yeah. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Uh, thanks so much for coming today. Uh, my name is Casey Hartung. I'm from Student Life. Um, and today's Wellbeing Masterclass is about mindfulness with Associate Professor Rodrigo Becerra from the School of uh, Psychological Science. Before we get started with the masterclass, I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that UWA is situated on, the Wajak Noongar people, and I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. So these um, wellbeing masterclasses are part of um, our mental health and wellbeing framework um, in which we hope to be able to improve the mental health and wellbeing of students and staff at UWA. And today's session is all about mindfulness and how it can uh, improve your well-being. So with that, I'll hand over to Rodrigo. And, oh, I can hear. I thought it was just for recording, but there is a speaker going around. Uh, thank you for having me. I'm honoured to have been invited to talk to you about mindfulness. And the idea is that, <clears throat> that you know um, or you understand probably the type of mindfulness we're promoting the research we do on mindfulness, the science behind, behind mindfulness. So the idea is to have a little practice, so if you do practice, you know every time you do it is different. And the idea is because it's an experiential type of uh, uh, presentation, we want to discuss your reactions to mindfulness. When I started to do uh, research on mindfulness 15 years ago, we used to do experiments. I taught at ECU for a few years and we did studies on novice practitioners, and it was very easy to find novice practitioners. But after 15 years, everyone has now some sort of experience with mindfulness. So the experiments on novice practitioners are becoming more and more difficult because of a good thing, right? So it's becoming so popular that everyone has done a short course or read about it at least. There is some familiarity. But we do want to talk about uh, mindfulness, an overview of mindfulness, the evolution of mindfulness, what's hot in mindfulness from a scientific point of view, uh, definition of mindfulness, because that seems to be quite a problematic um, thing today, different definitions about mindfulness. Uh, the research we do on mindfulness, if we have time, we started a bit late, so I'm not sure if we do a second practice, uh, mindfulness and academic performance. Uh, put your hand up if you're a student at UWA. Okay, so that would be an interesting topic. And mindfulness and applied psychology or well-being, which is the area that I focus on from a research point of view. Uh, sorry, I should have said uh, my name is Rodrigo. I'm an associate professor in the School of Psychological Science and I'm a researcher as well. I'm the director of the clinic where we train our clinical psychologist, uh, Robin Winkler Clinic. So that's the idea of mindfulness and apply psychology and well-being. So a few of schools of mindfulness and questions uh, after that. So we're going to, what I want you to do is to be generous. So if you have experience in mindfulness, uh, this is a three minute practice. And I'm very curious about your reactions to it, but I don't want you to be thinking too much. I want you to follow the instructions with generosity and compassion, right? Just focus on what this guy is saying, and I'll, I'll talk about him after a while. Let's see if it works. I might be playing with the volume for a bit, but uh, I'll, let's see how you go. Meditation 8 the three-minute breathing space. Taking a breathing space, making a definite change in your posture so it embodies a sense of being awake. Perhaps closing the eyes if that's possible. And beginning step one, by seeing what's going on in your mind and body right now. What's the weather pattern like inside? What thoughts are around? What feelings are here?
any sensations in the body. Not trying to change anything, but opening to what's already here. Then moving to step two, bringing the attention to the breath, narrowing the spotlight of attention on sensations of the breath in the abdomen, tuning into the changing physical sensations of the in-breath for its full duration and the out-breath for its full duration. And if the mind wanders, simply acknowledging where it went and gently escorting it back to the breath. And now step three, expanding the focus of your awareness around the breath to take in the whole body, as if the whole body were breathing now. Aware of your posture, your facial expression, sensations on the surface of the skin and from right inside the body. holding in awareness all the sensations in your body right now, just as they are. Coming home to the body. Coming home to this moment. Okay, so if come back to the room, if you, let me just see if I can progress to the next slide, oh, if you, and the next, oh, I'll take it from here. All right, so very brief, very, for all those who know about mindfulness, it's a very traditional practice for those who do not, what a weird thing to do, to focus on your breathing and your skin, and nothing else. And of course, this is a, a sample, almost a three minute. I forgot to say, I'm also a clinical psychology, psychologist, so I, I work, I've been, I have my private practice now, uh, Mondays and Saturdays, but I work in hospitals, I get to hospitals, I stay head injury units, the child in the hospital, and I run groups at the clinic here, and I've been using mindfulness for a very, very, very long time with clients right? People who are referred to us for psychological help. Anyway, we won't go around the room as I do in my classroom, but any comments about this particular practice with Mark Williams' voice instructing you? One at a time, please. <laughs> yeah. Very calming. Okay, excellent. It's one comment. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but once I, and once I am, um, yeah, it's, it's okay after that. Yeah. Excellent. Um, I haven't really done anything to do with mindfulness before, so for me, my mind was wandering a lot, but having this kind of there in the background brought it back a lot. So right. That's yeah. Excellent. Oh, so you never had experience with mindfulness? Okay. <laughs> Come to our experiment. <laughs> All right, any other comment? These are the type of things, again, sorry, go on. I usually don't enjoy things much, but mm -hmm. today, like the way he guides you through it, I enjoy it and it definitely helps me in calming down and centering. Right. But I'm usually not very fond of it, like I don't enjoy it, but today it was good. It was, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> we we'll get a positive feedback here when, <laughs> when we finish. Uh, because I've been doing it for such a long time, and I do it with students, so I teach in the postgrad program, those who are doing a master's PhD combining clean psych and neuropsych. 
So I, when I teach mindfulness, I ask them to practice and then give comments, right? Clients, students. And I couldn't focus, oops, I couldn't focus in the beginning, then it got easier, okay in the beginning, then it got harder. Kept thinking about pending tasks, boring, easy. Kept thinking, what? Kept thinking about assignments, I relaxed. Was worried about others looking at me. This is not for me, this is exactly what I needed. Is there a serious, is there a serious research behind this? These are some of the questions that I was still in, some people are thinking, well, I'm asking them not to think about these sort of things. But it's natural, right? It's like if you eat something and you ask the stomach, the stomach do not digest. This, if the stomach could talk, would say, what do you mean? I exist for digestion. That's my only role in this world. And you're asking me not to digest the food that you just ate. It's the same with the mind, so, so the mind is always busy. There is no such thing as a blank mind. There is always something in the mind, that's the existence of the mind. But what we are thinking and how we are going about it is quite beneficial or problematic, right? That's the idea. So we could classify these type of uh, answers that I was showing you before. What do you think type of categories uh, we could classify these? When we were doing it, I heard a door, and I heard something else there. My mic made a funny noise. Those are external distractions, right? And others are internal distractions, okay? Questioning the exercise itself, so intrinsic to the exercise, or others about something that you need to attend to. You know, I got an assignment. Why, what am I doing here? I should be studying, you know? So, tasks, pending, things in the future, things from the past, and so on and so forth. Or external distractions. You know, I had a friend who would not practice unless there is absolute silence. My concern with that is that that's never real, real life. Okay, so if there is a, a noise, or if there is, for me it's okay, because this is the idea of mindfulness. You focus on something, we'll talk about the definition, but we focus on something, we maintain that attention, and if we get distracted, we come back to it. That's it. Okay? That's it. It's so simple. So, grabbing your attention, your wandering off, your distraction, and coming back to that anchor is mindfulness. So if you get distracted many times when you're starting to practice mindfulness, it's not bad, it's good, for as long as you bring yourself back. That's the idea. So if you go to the gym, and you probably guess, I never go to the gym, but if you go to the gym, if you lift up some weight, and it's easy for you, and you go for a year doing that, you won't gain much. Right? But if, if it's a little bit difficult, if it challenges you, you're exercising the muscle that you want to exercise. So the whole, the key exercise for the mind muscle, so to speak, is bringing yourself back to the anchor. What anchor? Usually is the breathing, right? Because for some reason we tend to think that our, the core of our existence is behind the head. You know, I, this is referential, this is me, for some reason. We never take perspective of the world from the stomach projection or from the arms. It's usually around here where the ego resides, so to speak. And because breathing is so close to that, this anchor is a very good one to bring yourself back. But it could be anything, okay? Buddhists, everyone will say, the anchor is not, there isn't anything magical breathing or a flower or you know whatever you're focusing on the idea is to be able to focus and bring yourself back that's the idea so there are other myths about mindfulness mindfulness and religion people feel reluctant to go into mindfulness because they think it's is a bait to go into some sort of religion right buddhism particularly and we don't think so. You can practice mindfulness without going into religion, or you could go into religion. You have to be sitting, that's not true. You could be lying down. I do a lot of mindfulness practice. Oh, I discover the issue if I look down. Yeah, so I'll, I'll walk like that. It's not that I'm arrogant, it's I'm, I'm avoiding the microphone. 
So um, I practice mindfulness, sometimes I'm in bed and I hear the instructions, sit up, sit with the straight back. There I am sitting, <laughs> lying down. That's okay. It's that thing, that thing sorry, of bringing yourself back. Right. It's better sometimes to sit down because this is not to fall asleep, right? It's to be able to be awake on purpose and practicing that muscle. But if you fall asleep, I'd say, use it as well, right? One of the big transdiagnostic elements of good health is sleep. So if you have problems sleeping and this helps you to sleep, use it, right? But if you want to train your mind, that muscle in focusing, and what type of focusing and attention, we'll talk about it later on, then it doesn't matter. Duration of practice. How long do you think you need to practice per day if you want the benefits? Three minutes, Three minutes. <laughs> for per week, so you're done. <laughs> How long? Yep. Mm. That's a good idea, isn't it? Yeah. So every time you remember, you practice it. So how long each session do you think would be, will show benefits to you? We have three minutes. Three minutes one. Three minutes two. So, <laughs> you won. Okay, that's one of the things we do with my PhD students. We look at the, the dosage effect. You know, how long do you need to practice in order to benefit uh, from, from practice? And um, what we say is that, roughly speaking, 20 minutes is a good measure uh, to get benefit. When I started this, and I've probably more than 20 years ago to practice, but I was a psychologist at the psychiatric center in Fremantle Hospital, and there was a Buddhist monk who was a clinical psychologist, so I went with him and we ran groups with psychiatric patients. And he, being so high up in the hierarchy of uh, Buddhism, was very strict. So when he started, we had people with depression, anxiety, borderline, bipolar, you name it. And I would be helping him because he was a master. And then he would go, he started practicing with 20 minutes. I started to fall asleep after five minutes. Many of the clients wanted their cigarette after 10 minutes. And many people go, but he was so strict because he practiced for two, three, four hours per day. Right, in addition, uh, uh, on purpose, right, sitting down, in addition to his walking meditation and so on. So because I was trained and mentored by him, that's what, that was my idea. But I did, I did a, a mindfulness uh, training in Sydney when the Dalai Lama came uh, many years ago, and I did a workshop with Alan Wallace, who used to be a translator for the, for the Dalai Lama, and he did a workshop, a full-day workshop. He said, physicist in addition to a monk and translator, very, very genius. And anyway, in the workshop I said, what about the amount of practice? And he says something that I believed in immediately, whatever you can. So if it's three minutes or if it's two hours per day, you find your baseline. Right? So if you can concentrate, if you can practice it comfortably for five minutes, start with six or seven. If you can comfortably practice in the beginning for 10, start with 11 or 12 minutes. And then start to increase it, but find your own baseline. So I came back and I told Ian, we'll stop doing that with clients. When there is something crucial about our practice, I'll ask you to hook that idea to that uh, very realistic drawing of a hook that I brought. <laughs> so there are certain key elements that I want you to remember more than others, right? The complexity, the impact on goals, emotional life, I just realized that, uh, okay. So it's got serious attention from psychology in the, in the last 30 to 40 years, brought into the spotlight by someone called Jean Kabat-Zinn, who was working in a hospital with people with uh, very serious conditions. All neurologists and, uh, and doctors sent these people. There's nothing we can do from a medical point of view and he collected these people, got a room in the basement, and started to do mindfulness for chronic pain and chronic health issues. And from then on, it just exploded around the world. So John Kabat-Zinn, I'm neglecting other people here, but, you know, it's been from that time, 
they popularize and used a lot, but from a scientific research point of view, we still need to do more work. So remember, it's first developed, or at least articulated by Buddhist traditions two and a half thousand years ago. It's been described as the heart of Buddhist meditation. I'm talking about mindfulness, right? And traditionally described the Sanskrit word dharma, law, uh, lawfulness, or simply the way things are. That's the idea. Right? And there is a very important philosophical tradition in the Western world called phenomenology that is dedicated exactly to study the way things are without that uh, interference from epistemological views or scientific views as uh, describing the world. So the idea of accessing you know, the way things are, phenomenology, etymologically means that, the way things emerge or present themselves. So that idea of capturing that in that way without having too many cognitive epistemological or, or concepts between you and what you're trying to get to know. It's an inherent human capacity. Buddhism has been central in making it um, easy to bottle in it, so to speak, right? But it's an inherent uh, human capacity. So if you are abandoned on a mountain and you live there for t uh, 20 years without access to websites or books, you could develop mindfulness, right? It's like selling water by the river. It's fundamentally an attentional stance. That's mindfulness would be this. Because when it started in India, uh, then it went to, you know, perhaps China, Japan, then Indonesia and China, you name it. Each culture in their own time added definitions and added practices and so on and so forth. Then it went to California, right, and added other things there. But the idea is that central to meditation practice is the idea of mindfulness, which is paying attention, right, paying attention. Hook that to the realistic uh, drawing of a hook, right? So if you don't remember many things uh, today, remember it's a way of paying attention. That's what mindfulness is. So in the last 40 years, different Buddhist practices have been adopted in the West, and there are two, roughly two schools. I'm being lazy, there are more things and sophisticated uh, classifications, but mindfulness as a philosophy of life. So some people, like John kabat mindfulness should not be seized upon as the next promising cognitive behavioral technique where it would be decontextualized and plugged into an existing approach. So they say, no, you can't just practice mindfulness. There is more to it. There is a way of living life. There is a way of approaching life. And recently I discovered uh, Ron Perth, mindfulness podcast, and the, the link is there, who is absolutely scathing, you know, condemning the practice of mindfulness in the Western world because he says it's been sort of robbed of the actual ends, essence of mindfulness, right? And then there is another view, which I'm a bit closer to, which is we need to find ways to fit practices like mindfulness or any other spiritual tradition into the empirical scientific world uh, approach. It's a technique. So, as clinical psychologists, we want to help people. Okay, what can I do to help people? Oh, okay, cognitive techniques, behavioral techniques, relaxing. Uh, and then we look, oh, mindfulness, what is that? Will it help people with psychological problems? Yes, it does. Let's do more research, right? But you don't have to shave your head and become a monk and things like that to practice mindfulness unless you want to. But if you are my client, I'll teach you mindfulness technique to practice in the beginning for 10 to 15 minutes. And after the session, you can practice for two hours per day, three hours per day, whatever you want to do, right? But from a psychological point of view, in order to improve symptom uh, symptomatology related to depression, anxiety, or whatever, we need to agree on something, right? And clinical psychology or the therapeutic space is not there to endorse religious, political, or philosophical narratives. So we're happy with it as a technique. And this is a controversy that this guy, Perth, is going. Like it's being westernized and then he hit Time magazines 
with these upper middle class people looking and you know he was trying to show that it's been in a way commercialized if you wish. So there are two views, mindfulness as a philosophy, a way of life, mindfulness as a simple discrete technique. So I gravitate towards here being a clinical psychologist. I try to practice it more than 10-15 minutes per day when I can, but I see it as a technique for pe helping people. Right? Many of my clients that I have introduced them to mindfulness, then they keep going, they join a Buddhist temple or they uh, join practice, uh, mindfulness practice or meditation groups and they take it much more seriously than we, not seriously, more seriously, but more than we saw in, in, in therapy. Who practices mindfulness? Well, there is a group called professional meditators, yogi, full-time monks, living a monastic life, a very reduced number, people who practice and meditate all day long. Then you have people who study and practice it, centers of meditation, groups, etc. to the West. Then you have practice for a purpose, like mindfulness-based cognitive therapy. And then you have wide, uh, wider groups, occasional practice, uh, human resources in companies and so on. I would say Persa was sort of targeting this, this, this group here, yeah, most likely. I think it's a is to put it down when it's been so useful in helping people, right? Uh, there is a nice, the evolution of mindfulness. What's the time? How are we going to time? 1.35 OK, so there is an evolution of mindfulness here uh, slide, which is basically telling us how much attention is mindfulness as a scientific practice getting from you know, academics. And as you can see, uh, they divided from 1916 to 2018, and you can see the number of papers published, right? So around here, 2010, there about, this is the bulk of the studies now, and I think it keeps increasing. I have probably four PhDs working on, on mindfulness, and most of the international students will call me and say, I'd like to do a PhD with you, not all of them, <coughs> I do other things, are saying, I want to study mindfulness. Anyway, so I'll probably jump uh, from slide to slide, but the people, uh, is they look at mindfulness, you know, child student models, social programs, sort of general studies of mindfulness. And then if we move to 2000 to 2009, 10, therapy starts to become more interested in mindfulness and then today more specific areas of mindfulness, right? So more very, very specific areas rather than, rather than what is mindfulness? What is it good? Is it good for, you know, uh, what's the what, what and background and so on? Today it's more about can we apply it to very specific things? Can we do research on that? There are people who are less sympathetic to mindfulness, like uh, Albert Ellis, who, sorry, yeah, who uh, created rational emotive therapy. And I use him because he and Albert um, Aaron Beck created cognitive therapy. But I use him because he was quite vocal about mindfulness, well, about many things. He was a character. And he wouldn't shy about, you know, away from giving opinions. But he would say, oh, rational emotive therapy also pays attention to your mental phenomena, but adds to it disputing. So I train your mind to be a very good scientific uh, tool as well. And it leads to relaxation. So would you just need to practice rational emotive therapy? But I think he's missing the point. Well, he also said that this is a very nice cartoon. There is a sunset in the background, and this man is showing the sunset to the television set. Albert Ellis is saying, it's impossible to access the direct experience. It's always something. And rational emotive therapy does it well. So you'll never be able to contemplate the thing in itself. Um, the other important thing is the idea is to practice mindfulness for the practice of mindfulness rather than, I'm going to practice mindfulness now so I can do well tomorrow on my test. Right? So there is a purpose for that. I want to run on the gym 
because they have a race in two months. So that running, the whole purpose is that race. Whereas mindfulness um, practice is the moment in itself as it unfolds during the practice, the experience. That's the core of mindfulness. So if you're thinking, well, I didn't get relaxed after this practice. Right? This was good. Well, it's a good evaluation, but it's not what we're after, right? So seeing something as good, bad, useful, useless, you know, practical, impractical, beneficial, and so on, is applying a judgment to it. And we want to devoid, we want to take away the idea of judging the experience. That's why it's so difficult. That's why people are not practicing mindfulness, you know, every day, all day, because it's so difficult not to evaluate, judge what we're contemplating. We'll talk more about the basic definition. There are quite a few significant tests there, but I think in today's age you can find all the texts if you turn on your <laughs> computer. And these are the hot things that are happening in mindfulness today. Mindfulness journal is, a, I put the impact factor, I don't know, in finances or biochemistry, but in psychology, 3.8 impact factor mean is a good journal, right? A very good journal. So mindfulness is a relatively new journal and it's got already 3.8. And these are the type, of, we have one submission currently with them. Trauma in victims of gun violence, uh, mother-infant bonding, there's the entire title. Psychometric evaluation, there are a lot of psychometric studies looking at the uh, internal consistency and reliability of uh, psychometric scales for mindfulness. Evidence from psycho uh, borderline personality disorder, uh, chronic dispositional mindfulness. Dispositional mindfulness is some people are born with something called mindfulness. One person in my social life who is naturally mindful, everything. I had to fight to and practice to be mindful, right? I have to remind myself every morning I come uh, to work and I say, call so-and-so, reply this, review this chapter, mindfulness. You know, I know about mindfulness. I practice it for a long time. I do research on it, yet I need to remind myself to stop. And uh, but this person doesn't practice. She just walks. She doesn't walk. She, she glides in the end. <laughs> <laughs> and when she's talking to a friend, I was telling her today or a couple of weeks ago, but do, don't you get annoyed? Because if she's asking you this for money and then it leaves her, I suppose so, but when I can, I say no, and when I can, I, I, I give her a leave, you know. I, I hate, I hate her. <laughs> I don't hate her, I admire her. So there are people who are dispositionally mindful. <clears throat> so it's a big topic in research now. Dispositional uh, negative bias, behavioral problems, and so on and so forth. Now, this I want you to hook, or someone is trapped in the room. You're, you're condemned to finish the lecture. So, you see, the hook that I put there, I want you, out of the things you remember, I want you to remember this definition, right? The non-judgmental observation of what's occurring in the present moment. So if you remember, sometimes I spend a whole lecture just going component by component of this, uh, of this. The non-judgmental, what I was referring to before, right? It's very difficult for us to contemplate something and not make a judgment. But making a judgment or an evaluative sort of assessment brings an emotion and brings a response. So the idea of mindfulness is that you contemplate something, e.g. breathe, sensations in the body, and so on. Whatever you're using as an anchor, and experience it the way it is, not comparing it to a previous experience or a utilitarian approach to it, right? So being non-judgmental is crucial because not, I'm not talking about judgmental in the common use of, you know, being judgmental as a personality feature. I'm talking about evaluating something as good or bad and, and so on. So not doing that is very difficult. Very, very difficult. I'm going to contemplate and focus on my breathing for the next 10 minutes without evaluating that experience. Extremely difficult. In the present moment, that's another difficult thing, right? 
So we've been trained, and I'll show another slide to talk about this, but I'll jump ahead. We've been trained, so what was that good for? What, what sort of evaluation do you make of that experience? Tell us about that fight you had with your partner. What are the, you know, how can you apply that to the future? What are you going to be doing when you finish your undergrads? You know, which, so we go from past to future, past to future, and it's very difficult to stop in the present, right? So if you suffer from anxiety and you have a presentation in five weeks and the presentation is 10 minutes and you suffer for four weeks for that presentation, it doesn't add up, right? Why? Because 10 minutes, go, they go like that, but you are suffering because you're projecting your emotional state for the next four weeks, just thinking of those 10 minutes. And usually people tend, end up saying, ah, it wasn't as bad as I thought it would be. But, because you are intelligent people, and that's evident because you are studying at university now, you have the capacity, which is a, you know, a very good attribute, but it could also be a problem. You have the capacity to project yourself and to remember. And then we travel between those two and we negate the present. So if you are anxious right now, it can be because you're focusing in the present. It must be because you are actually thinking of the future or the past. So if I stop 100 people with depression and I say, what are you thinking right now? If they have depression, they're going to say, I shouldn't have stayed in that relationship for that long. I shouldn't have said that to my friend. I think I hurt him. I should have, uh, you know, called my brother more often. I, I don't think that was the right decision in terms of work. It's a lot about the past. So if you stop people suffering from depression, there is an over uh, sort of focus on the past. If you stop 100 people with anxiety, thinking right now, most of the time it's like, oh, I'm not sure if I'll get the job. Yeah, I have a thesis to submit, you know, when is it? Oh, in two years. But I'm thinking that, you know, all right, and, you know, I have to, you know, I'm going to ask that uh, person to go out with me. I'm going, to, I'm, going to, I'm going to, you know, it's future oriented. So these features of psychopathology, past and future, tend to escape the present, that inability to focus on the present. This is a nice room. You're sitting in a comfortable chair. We should be okay. But if it isn't, there is some sort of projection or remembering, okay? So that's the idea. So the non-judgmental observation of what's occurring in the present. Some people, the other definition I like, they say non-reactive, which I like, you know, so you're contemplating, you don't react. Anyway, we're doing a lot of research. That's mindfulness meditation, improve the emotional process of regulation, reactivity, uh, in depression, in anxiety. So we do things like assessment and experiment experiment control which is relaxation in the past you had only two groups a passive control wait list and mindfulness but the editors of journals are getting more and more, more and more sort of strict and saying well it doesn't say mindfulness per se is good it says something that stopped them from doing something for 20 minutes per day we say well, it's different well have a, an active control. Okay, we'll do relaxation. And then we do assessment again. We, the psychophysical responses are typically, and they come to the lab, they complete subjective measure scales and questionnaires. Then we apply this physiological sensors, five minute uh, blank screen, just to get baseline of the physiological reactions. It's a negative film, that's when we show horrible things to poor students. Well, it's the only time we can combine. Uh, <laughs> and three minutes blank to get uh, physiological activity. Uh, and removal of the equipment. Now here is a typical experiment, one negative, I don't know, you are very young, but in my days, Kathy Bates break someone's ankles, a writer that uh, was forced to stay with her. And as we are behind the subject of <laughs> seeing how the, sub the participants suffer, we're measuring their physiological activity. 
activity. And now we are adding things, not only GSI, but Ray, Ray, and things like that. Our students is doing neural activities of based training in pre-adolescent children, functional near infrared spectroscopy, if nurse, looking at the impact of mindfulness on the psychophysiological, but also what regions of the brain of the brain are moving. This is another experiment we're doing now where we're combining GSR, heart rate, and FNRs. That's why I put that, you know. Uh, so, do that. How are we going with time? Quarter two. So, okay, I'll have to finish soon. The idea is that these are experiments we, we did a while ago, and we look at uh, attention. Remember, if it's attention, uh, the core of mindfulness, so the important uh, researchers on attention say there are three types of attention. Alerting, which is you stay, you're doing a puzzle, how long can I stay? People can stay and then they wander off. Okay, that's it. You know, my concentration is bad. And when we mindfulness with those people, their attention, the alerting attention after eight weeks didn't very much, right? But their orienting attention, which is paying attention to that or that, you know, I'm doing this, but I want to keep an eye on the telephone or the kettle, you know, and that improved a lot. And then executive functioning or executive attention, the ability to pay attention to that while I'm doing this, so I can go back to that and then this and so on, much more complex. And that improved. This is eight weeks of 20 minutes of practice, right? So that's the idea. There are many universities, because one of the questions I have, I get from science people, those who are psycho psychologists, like, is this serious? Who teaches this? This in the world now have mindfulness, mindfulness, dedicated personnel, and so on and so forth. Cambridge, uh, UCLA, UCLA, Stanford, Oxford University, and so on. Academic performance, I'll be brief because we're running out of time, but there seems to be a positive gain. So if you want to get better results in academia, we suggest you practice mindfulness, right? Because there are quite a lot of studies looking at that, uh, and it seems to work. However, this is a caveat. It works in the short term. So the other feature of mindfulness is that it's one of those skills you need to keep practicing. Right? So if you play a musical instrument and you stop for a long time, your fingers get rusty. You don't play with the same fluency, with the same capacity, with the same precision if you practice every day. If you ride a bicycle, that's fine. That's another type of skill. You never forget that. But there are other types of skills that need ongoing practice. So all performance show that it will help you in the short term but you need to keep practicing and this is a study we did with a student at ECU pain she had a stroke and left hemiplegia paralyzed left side of the brain because of right frontal stroke a right stroke and as you know it's a contralateral for a lot of neuropathic pain which is more difficult to take care of and you can see decrease, but it went up again, up. So it's all in line with the literature saying that mindfulness is something that you need to keep practicing if you want to enjoy the benefits of it. In psychology, well, it's the same thing. I'm going to summarize it, but the most important of new wave is called the third wave of cognitive behavior therapies, meaning the ones that are studied scientifically mostly. Most, the, you know, so we have behaviorism, first wave, cognitive therapy, second wave, and the third wave, you have things like acceptance and commitment therapy, mindfulness-based stress reduction, dialectical behavior therapy, mindfulness-based cognitive therapy. Oh, mindfulness stress reduction, this is John kabat -Zinn. But all of them have in common one component, which is practice of mindfulness. So it seems to be quite important component from a therapeutic point of view. Uh, I spoke about past, future, past, future. There's much more to talk about that.
but the idea is to go back to the present. Hook that, please, on, on that, because that's another important key component. So we have, I think I'm going to skip, you don't need to know about this, but these particular schools, but we teach this in, a, in the clinic where, where I work here. And we just see if we have time for questions and discussion. I like this book, I give this book to my clients and we go chapter by chapter sometimes, in addition to other discussions, of course. So I suggest you go for it. I know that UWA is preparing no, it's not preparing, it's a meditation center with meditations as well, right? Anyway, questions? Yep. I think maybe get the non-judgmental part, so when the child said that I liked doing what I did today, yeah. is that again judgmental? It, yeah, but not in the sense that you were a judgmental person. You can like things, the, mind, the practice of mindfulness, but what we're saying is that while you're practicing mindfulness, you're not doing it to get a nice feeling, a nice reaction to it. But I like mindfulness, I practice it, I study it, I love mindfulness, I find it interesting. You know, and to study happening at the mind level, not the brain level, I find it fascinating. It's okay, but the, the, not to confuse that with the purpose of the practice of mindfulness, right? A byproduct is relaxation and feeling good. Yeah? Anyway, if you have further questions, comments, please uh, write to me. That's my email address. And I think uh, if we don't have more questions, uh, one of you wanted to say something at the end? Uh, oh, I, I skipped many. No, I'm. Oh, that, yeah. 